I wish I was in Copenhagen. Copenhagen's a beautiful place. I was there um, earlier uh, last year um, and it's absolutely delightful. Unfortunately, it's not to be at the moment. We're all stuck at home, which stuck at home for me means like it's not actually a terrible place to be. It's rather nice. It's a place called Yorkshire. Uh, it's in the north of England, halfway between London and Scotland. Um, and it's rather nice. It's like this town that's set in the, the country dales and you've got kind of countryside and lots of good walking and running. But it's a fairly small place. There's like the shops and stuff like that. But if you want to go and see a movie, if you want to go to the big shops and stuff like that, you generally have to go to a city nearby. So I'll hop in my car and go to one of my nearest cities, which is a place called Bradford. And I'll be driving to Bradford and thinking, as one does, driving a car, where am I going to park my car? I have to find a car park. And so my mind turns to like, well, where is my nearest car park that's actually got some available spaces? Or there's a particular car park that's close to the movie theatre, so are there any spaces in that particular one? Or maybe I'm driving around town and I can't find any car parks that have got space, so it'd be useful if I could be told when there is one with space that becomes available. I'm being a bit of a data nerd, I wonder how occupancy varies over time. If I could go and analyse the different car parks and how does that particularly trend? So as I say, this is me, uh, developer advocate at Confluent. Uh, Confluent uh, one of the companies that contribute to the open source Apache Kafka project. We've got our own managed Kafka service in the cloud called Confluent Cloud. Um, follow me on Twitter. I've also got a YouTube, which I started thanks to lockdown. So uh, armoff.dev slash YouTube. And there's a bunch more videos like this one on there. So car parks. Well, fortunately, um, there's this kind of open data initiative and various places, including Bradford Council, publish feeds of data about um, the whole area. And one of those feeds has information about the car park occupancy. And this updates every few minutes. And from that feed, we're going to build a system which is going to let us send to the user information about those car parks. So for my front end, I'm using a tool called Telegram, which you may or may not be familiar with. It's like WhatsApp and uh, Facebook Messenger. It's a, a messaging platform. And it's got a really nifty API that you can write bots against to automate these kind of things. So that's the idea. That's what we're going to build. And it's kind of like it's just a hello world type example of the kind of things that you can build with um, these kind of tools. Uh, but it's kind of fun to show what you can do. So let's actually see it in action. So on the left hand side here, I'm actually running my code. Um, if we get a chance, I'll actually go into the code itself and show you. And on the right hand side is Telegram. So this is my, my bot here on the left and here's Telegram on the right. Telegram has got a, a mobile app as well, or iPad or however you want to access it, but this is just on the desktop. So I'm going to start talking to the bot. I'm going to click on start down here. And you can see on the left hand side, the bot says, yeah, I received a message. Um, it was a command saying slash start. So the bot has now sent me some information about how to use it. So we're going to say this. We're going to say, based on my current location, which is over here, and we click on that and send it a location. And then we're going to say, well, let's see um, where your nearest car park is. So it said, well, here's your longitude and latitude. And we're going to say, as the crew flies, which, park is, which uh, car park is closest to that point. So not like which is the quickest to navigate to, but which one, if you just draw a direct line on a map, is going to be closest to it. This is okay. This is your closest one. It's called Westgate. There's a map for it. And at the moment, it's got 110 car park spaces free. So that's pretty useful to know. But maybe I've got a particular car park in mind. Say that, well, there's this one here. It's called Broadway, I think. And I wonder if that's got any spaces free, because I like to park at that one. And it turns out where well, it's got a whole bunch of spaces free. So over uh, 1,100 spaces free. Now, in the UK at the moment, we're under lockdown, so there's very few people actually going out into cities and parking up. So it's kind of not surprising that there's a bunch of spaces free at the moment. But let's say, hypothetically, that 100,000, sorry, 100, um, 1,000 spaces isn't enough for me to park in. And actually, we'd like to find a car park that's got a bunch more spaces. So in fact, tell me when there is a car park that becomes available with a certain number of spaces. So this we're going to say, well, set an alert. And let's say, well, let's say 500. It's still going to trigger for this one here, but maybe there's other car parks as well. So for that, we're going to see when a new message is received from the API, when we get new data coming in, we can check against that threshold that we've set. And now it's going to push to the user whenever we get that data coming in. So this is the kind of things that we've built. We've done lookups against the data. We've done event-driven notifications against the data. And I want to walk through now how I've actually built that and put it together. So we're going to close down Telegram. Otherwise, it's going to keep on pinging at us. And we're going to kill the bot uh, as well. 
And we're actually going to have a look at the kind of code um, and the processes that sit behind it. So what we've got over here is the actual demo itself. So if you actually want to go and try this for yourself, you can, because the API, it's a public API, you don't need credentials. So you go to the demo scene repository from uh, Confluent on GitHub, and there's actually the, a Docker Compose, there's the demo script that I'm following, um, so you can try it out for yourself. So get Docker, Docker Compose, Docker Compose up, and then you've got the full stack that I'm running here. So to start off with, let's have a look at the data itself. So the data itself comes from this API. So I've got my, my demo script that I just showed you on my screen down here, which is why I keep looking up and down. And it looks like this, the data. So here's the, uh, the REST endpoint. We just can use curl to pull that data in. And to start with, we're going to pipe it through tail, which just strips off the header. So the data we're getting from the API, it's just a bunch of comma-separated data. And we've got things like a field here, which I, look, I guess is the date, and this here, which looks like a time, and the name of the car park, the capacity, the spaces, and so on. We piped it through tail to get rid of the header, because if we leave that off, we'll see that the header itself tells us the field names. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this dump of data and stream it into Kafka. And each row on here is going to become a message in Kafka. So what we don't want to do is put onto a Kafka topic this kind of thing here, because that's just going to not make sense. That's not actually the payload. That's just the metadata, which we'll use later, but we don't put it onto the topic itself. So to get this data onto our Kafka topic, we're going to pipe it out of tail. And we're going to pipe it through this really useful utility called Kafka Cat. So I think there are several of you mentioned that you're using Kafka already. If you're not familiar with Kafka Cat, go and check it out. It's super useful. It's like Netcat for Kafka, and it integrates really nicely with the Linux philosophy of pipes. So we can pipe data into it as a producer. We can consume data from Kafka and pipe it out of it onto other applications using pipes. So we're going to pipe the output of tail into Kafka Cat. Here's my broker. Here's my topic, and we're going to act as a producer. I'll get rid of that T. So that's now going to pull the data from that endpoint and produce it to a Kafka topic. Are we sure it's got into the Kafka topic? Well, we can read messages from that Kafka topic. We could do so using Kafka Cat, but now is a good time to have a look at uh, KSQL DB. So here's KSQL DB. It's as the, uh, the tagline here says, it's an event streaming database for Apache Kafka. It's very, very cool because it's built using Apache Kafka, and it does two key things for us. It does stream processing. It does uh, streaming ETL. It lets you say, I've got data here. I'd like to manipulate it and transform it and join it and do aggregates and stuff like that and write it back to another topic on the broker. But it also lets us build materialized views, which we can query the state of directly from our applications. And that's what I was doing in that Telegram bot where we said, how many spaces are there in this car park? That was querying directly against KSQL DB. Anyway, I'm skipping way ahead of myself here. We've got KSQL DB, and it does that stuff I just told you, but it also acts as a consumer and a producer also if you want to for Kafka topics. So we say, what topics are there on the broker? There's a topic called car parks. And we can say, print car parks from beginning. Show me all the data. And it just says, I'm going to act as a consumer. I'm going to go to the topic, I'm going to pull out the data, guess at the serialization format, it just looks like it's a string, and here is my data. And if we go back to here and we run that same command, that same curl piping through into Kafka Cat, and we run that and we go back to, to um, KSQL DB, you'll see we've got another screen full of data. So 15.04 was when I ran, ran it before, 15.07 is that. Or rather, that's the timestamp from the API, so it's not the actual timestamp of ingest. So we've got data coming from an API, which was streaming into Kafka. I'm actually going to set this running on a loop. So piping data into Kafka Cat into Kafka is an OK way of getting data in, and it's perfectly valid for like a proof of concept or just a demo like this. You'd probably go for something a bit more resilient if you were doing this for real in a production environment. You'd use something like Kafka Connect, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So we're going to take our slightly hacky method and make it really hacky just by dumping it inside a while loop and say like every, uh, should say every 10 seconds, pull the API, dump the return into a Kafka topic. OK, so that's now running. And if we watch that screen for a moment, you'll see it's going to dump uh, another set of data in any moment now, and it'll tick over with a bunch more messages. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that data and we're going to say, well, comma separated is OK enough. Well, it's not really, because it's just comma-separated fields of data. What are those fields of data? 
we want to do something with it. We want to be able to say, how many spaces are there available in this particular car park? And in making that question, there are a bunch of assumptions we're making about the data that we can say in this car park, that car park is an entity within that data. Spaces is an entity, is a value within that data. So we need to describe how we're going to access it. We need to describe the schema of the data. So this is where that header of the data comes in. It told us what the field names are. And we're going to do this. We're going to say, create a stream in case equal DB. And a stream is simply a Kafka topic, which is an unbounded series of events. It's a Kafka topic with a schema. Now, Kafka topics can be serialized in different ways. You can serialize them, as we saw here, using CSV. We can use JSON. Both of those don't have an explicit schema. Hence, you have to enter them manually like this. If you're using Avro, if you're using Protobuf, if you're using JSON schema, then you don't have to type in that schema because it already exists in the schema registry. So you simply write your program, you write your code here, then create stream against this topic and the value format is Avro or something, and it pulls down the schema. But how have we do it? We've now got a stream. Uh, we say, clear that and show streams. We've got a stream called car park source against this Kafka topic here, and the data format is delimited. And because we've got a schema, we can do this. We can project fields from that data. So offsets reset to earliest means go back to the beginning of the Kafka topic because data in Kafka doesn't get deleted when it's being read, it gets deleted based on the retention policies, which is something separate. So we're gonna read data from that topic from the beginning of the topic. We're gonna to apply that schema to it and say, just show me the date and time, the name of the car pack and the number of empty places and just show me the first five. So it says, okay, here are those first five messages within that topic. It says, you've got this car pack here and this one here, and these are how many empty spaces there are. So we can use key SQL DB to start to poke around inside the data and see what fields exist and see what uh, data exists. We can use uh, where clauses. We can apply predicates to it. We can also join to data that sits in other topics, perhaps we've ingested from other systems. We can also build aggregations. So one of the things that we're going to do first before we can build any aggregations is we're going to take this set of data and I'm going to process it a little bit further because so far all we've done is we said ingest this stream of data and show it to the user. The Kafka's topic still remains as it is. We're simply applying something on top which is read it and output it to the console. But now we're going to do this. Instead of saying create a stream on top of an existing topic and that's more kind of like registering or declaring a stream on top of a topic with a schema. Now we're going to say create a stream here and we're going to create it as the results of this select. So like in the relational database world, you say create table as select, create a new table with the results of this select statement, executes against the data and writes it to the new table. And that's like a static thing and it does it and it's finished. In the streaming world, we have the same concept, create a new object populated by a select against an existing object but the objects here are streams. So a stream is an unbounded series of events, continues forever. And so the select that we run against that stream is also unbounded and runs forever. The example I showed you previously said limit five, just show me five messages and then we're done. Without that limit clause, it continues forever because the source data is unbounded. So we can take this idea of a continuous query and say, here is my select statement. And I'll explain what we're doing in that select in a moment take that select statement against this source stream here and write the results of that select into this new stream here. And a new stream is backed by a Kafka topic. And we could override that topic name if we wanted to. What we are overriding is the format, the serialization format in which we write that data. Because Kafka topics, the messages are just bytes, key value bytes. So we're saying, well, instead of dumping CSV onto there, and every poor soul who wants to use that data has to find out the schema first and then type in the schema next, which is error prone and tedious. We say, we're gonna serialize it as protobuf. We're gonna write that data using protobuf. We could use Avro or JSON schema if we wanted. Serialize that data, which stores the schema in the schema registry. And now anyone who wants to use that data has got access to that schema. So select the data from the source, write it to the target in protobuf. Select all of the data from the source, that select style, but also do a few more things. Take that date and time, which we kind of assume is a timestamp, but actually apply the um, logic to it, which says here are the particular values within it, because did they use US or European date formatting? 
And what's the time zone? Well, we notice it's London time zone and convert it from a string into an actual timestamp format, a uh, timestamp type. We can do some calculations on the data. We can also build objects within the data and change the schema this way. We can create a struct. We can take the latitude and longitude that's returned from the API and we can build that into an object. And we can also add in some static data for kind of lineage purposes. So we've done that. And now instead of dumping a bunch of output to the screen, it will say any moment now, I've created that query. I'm going to execute that in the background. And if we say show streams, it's going to say, okay, we've got a new stream here called car park events, backed by a Kafka topic of the same name. The format though is Protobuf. And if we take this here, we can say, describe uh, that uh, stream. It says, well, here's your new schema with all the different fields in it. We can also say describe extended. And this is, okay, how many messages have we processed? When was the last message that we processed? We've got metrics because we've written an application. How many messages are we processing per second? So we have processed 304. Now we've processed 312 because our API is polling every 10 seconds. So if I keep on talking and rerun that, we're going to see that's now gone up because we're getting new sets of data all the time. So we're processing that data as it arrives and writing it to that target topic. If I say show topics, we can see we've got one called car park events. I can say print car park events. This is all here is the contents of that topic. Now we're just back to running, running consumer from within key SQL DB. So now the point is we have a Kafka topic, which any application can connect to and read from. Let me just have a, a sip of my drink before my throat gives out. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this data that we've cleansed and put into a decent format and applied a schema and written back onto Kafka. The purpose of that being now anyone can use that car park data. Now anyone can say, well, this is a timestamp. It's a native timestamp format. <coughs> Excuse me. Here is a struct. Here is the schema. We can just use this data for other applications. That's why we wrote it back on to a Kafka topic. But now we can do other things. We can say, let's build ourselves a materialized view against that data. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to say, set the offset back to the earliest. We want to process everything that's in that source. And now we're going to create another object where this object is a table. Before we create the stream, a stream, series of unbounded events with a schema. A table is a Kafka topic, but taking the data in that Kafka topic and telling us the state, telling us the value for a given key. And it's got a schema. So now we're saying create a table called car park with the results of this select statement. And this select statement gives us an aggregate, which is why it's a table, because an aggregate tells you the value for a given key. And the aggregate values are probably going to change for that key, which is why we don't want it as a stream. We want it as a table. We don't want to see like what was the aggregate all the time along through. We want to know what's the aggregate state. Even if we get new messages coming in and updating those fields and averages and so on, we want to see the state of that aggregate. So we're going to group it by name, the name of the car pack. And we're going to say, what was the latest timestamp data that we've received for it? What's the latest value in terms of the capacity and the empty places? What's the average number of empty places? From our source stream here that we created, group it by the name of the car pack. So now we've created a table. And again, this is a query in the background. And again, this is a Kafka topic that we've built. I say show topics, we've got a topic called car pack. And we can query it. So we can do this. We can say, I would like to see how many spaces are available and the average number of empty spaces for this particular car park. And it says, well, this is the current number of empty spaces in that particular car park. And that was the time that the API gave us. And if you notice this here, it says query terminated. So we've gone from saying an unbounded series of events that we query with a continuous query that keeps on outputting to saying we've built a materialized view of state. And I can query that state and state has got state. And once you've queried it, it returns. I could also say, I would like to know when that state changes. I say, okay, emit changes. So now it says, well, here's the current value. And then I'm going to keep on telling you as that changes. So as we receive new data, as that aggregate value changes, or possibly doesn't, unless someone comes and goes from the car pack, which at the current environment is unlikely, then you're just going to see as the aggregate changes, you get the new values coming from it. But it's coming from the same underlying data, which is modeling it semantically in, uh, in different semantic ways. 
So what I've shown you here is called a push, sorry, it's called a pull query. And a pull query says, what's the current state in this materialized view? And it says, okay, I'll return that. And a push query is this here, where we say, oh, I'd like to, in effect, subscribe to a stream of changes, either from a table, as the aggregate values change, or indeed against the stream itself. So if we have a stream, so we could run the same thing, and we could say from car park events. So that's the stream that we built previously. And it says we well, can't do that. And I'll probably say you can't do a lot of that because I'm ad-libbing in a live demo, which is always a silly idea. So let's come back to that. And instead, let's see what we can do with these pull queries. So the pull queries that we saw, it gives you the current answer. And what completes the next piece in the picture of what I showed you in that demo earlier is that not only can you run pull queries from within the command line interface, you can also run them using an external client. So there's a REST API that you can use. There's a Java client that ships with KSQL DB. There are community uh, Python and Go clients that you can use for KSQL DB. So you can build your applications that then make a call against KSQL DB to say, what's the current state? So let's show you that briefly here. So if we open up another terminal window, we can use curl. Again, we're going to go against the KSQL DB uh, REST endpoint here. And we pass it the same query. Here is our SQL. Select from the car part where name equals this. And it says, well, here is the current value. So there I'm using the REST API, but in practice, you'll be using that from within your applications, from within your Java applications, your Go, your Python, however. And if you don't have a native client for those languages, you can just use the REST API because all languages support making REST calls. So you can access the state of a materialized view, which we've built in KSQL DB. And KSQL DB is a distributed scalable system. It's built on top of Kafka, or rather it's built on top of Kafka Streams, which is built on top of Kafka. So Kafka Streams is part of Apache Kafka. KSQL DB is a like, further abstraction above it. But in terms of scaling workloads and partitioning and all that kind of good stuff, we get that with KSQL DB. The other type of query I showed you was a push query. The uh, better example I should have shown you instead of trying to make it up as I went along, which is the whole reason for having a cheat sheet for a demo, is this one here, where we say, I've got a series of inbound events. Let's just look at the latest messages that come in. And it's going to do this. So by saying latest, we've now gone to the end of the topic and we'll only see new messages as they arrive. So now we're gonna say for this particular car park here, show me if it matches this car park name and it's got more than zero empty spaces. So we do that and now every 10 seconds when we get a dump of data from the API, it's gonna say, is it greater than zero? If it is, write it out to the screen. And so instead of writing it out to the screen, we can actually make that call again from our clients or from the REST API, which looks like this. Again, it's the same query. So you, you always kind of like prototype these things within the command line and then uh, run them for real from within your applications. So here's what it looks like running um, a call against the uh, REST endpoint for a push query. Here we're subscribing to a stream of events. We're saying, based on this predicate, return these fields to my application. And your application will have to expect to not receive a closed connection and just sit there and process those results as they come in. So here's our first one. So it's got that information that there's 591 uh, spaces available in this particular car park at that particular point in time. So these event-driven notifications that we can set up, obviously car parks and available space is one example, but orders and order thresholds or um, any number of like error rates in an application or any kind of things on which you want to receive an alert when something happens rather than have to write an application which polls to see has this happened yet. So it's a really important uh, pattern to be able to take advantage of. The other thing that we want to do, which I kind of hinted at in my, my opening spiel about car parks and driving into Bradford, is to actually use this data to analyze what happens in the car parks over time. So the bot that we've written has said like, I would like to know which is my nearest car park or how many spaces are available or tell me when there's a space available. But this stream of data we're getting from the API and we're capturing into Kafka, it's also really useful to be able to take that and to be able to put it into a system for analysis. So within KSQL DB, we can make a call out to Kafka Connect. So Kafka Connect is part of Apache Kafka again, and it's the integration API. 
it lets you use configuration to say stream data in from this point or stream data out to that point there. So I did a talk uh, this morning and yesterday about Kafka, the ecosystem. So go and check out the recording of that if you want to know more about Kafka Connect. And what we're going to do here is we're going to say create a sync connector and we're going to sync data down to Elasticsearch. So take data from this topic here, uh, which is the one that we've prepared. And we said like create this structured object here and apply the schema and do all of that kind of stuff. Take that topic and push it down to this Elasticsearch endpoint. So we create that connector and we say show connectors and it says this connector here is running. And then what we can do is we can head over into Elasticsearch and it says, okay, here is a dashboard that I built earlier. And you can actually look at that data as it changes over time. And because we did things like create a struct within the data with the uh, latitude and longitude, Elasticsearch recognizes that as a geo point. So we can plot that data onto a map and say, well, here is one set of data. Here is another set of data. We can filter it. We can uh, drill into particular areas. We can see how it varies over time. But what we've done here is that same data that came in from the API once, we're using that for driving a bot. We're also using it for building analytics. Let me show you a bit of the code briefly. Um, and then we'll finish off with some slides to kind of talk through the different things that we've seen. So let's uh, cancel that for now because we don't need it anymore. And we can say, open up the uh, text editor. So this is looking at the Go code. Now, I'm not actually like a legitimate programmer. I just kind of like, hack my way around these things. I'm much more like a SQL database -y type person. But over the summer, I thought I'd kind of, it'd be quite good to learn something um, to be able to talk, if not knowledgeably, then at least kind of like relatively I've had experience in. So I set myself a task of learning Go. So if you look at this code and say like, oh, that's gross, then do let me know, but be gentle. So what I've got here in this code is we use the Telegram Bot API library. Like it's, it's super useful to work with. And let's uh, zoom that a bit so we can see what's going on. And so using that, you authorize the Telegram. You get like a, an API token. And I'm going to pass that across here. And then it says, okay, if you're authorized on a particular account, and then you connect to your bot, and then your bot receives all of these different updates. So say I'd like to subscribe to my updates, and it creates a channel in Go called like an updates channel. And then what we do is we simply iterate over those updates as they arrive. And updates will be of different types. So we can say we've got a, um, a command. There's our case statement. There's our case statement. So it can either be a command, it could be a location. And if it's not that, then we assume that it's actually just a string that they've sent us and that we want to process that as a car park lookup. So if it's a car park lookup, we're going to say we're assuming that it's a status request for a given car park. We call a routine here called check spaces and the name of the car park that they've sent us, which comes from a message text here. And if we do that, and if I remember my shortcuts, and I forgot my shortcuts, uh, go to definition, that's the one. And that hopefully is going to show us the code itself. And that's going to be over here. So check spaces. And it says, I'm going to run this query against case equal DB. So whilst it's like co go code in the, uh, uh, the main part of it, we're actually using the case equal DB uh, client library, which says, well, I'll take this particular string that you give me and I'll run it as a pull request against case equal DB. And then we get the outputs back. We put our different values into the different variables and we can return that back to the Telegram client, which will then send it back to the user uh, with this. It'll send a response and it'll format it using silly emojis and then it sends it back using the API and the new message call. So that's the kind of thing it does. Um, for the location, for the, um, if it's a command, like the alert, the alert one is done using a push query. So if I show you that, if they say we want to create an alert, this is okay. We're going to take the threshold, uh, which is the arguments that are passed in. So like slash alert 500. So our threshold is 500. And we take that and we've got our alert spaces. Because it's a push query, it blocks. So we're going to set this as a Go routine that runs in a separate thread. And as and when we receive results back from that push query, we handle those and push them out to the user. So let's have a little talk about what we actually built. We took data coming in from an API. So in this case, from Northern Data Hub, from the Bradford Council, they publish an API. You can pull that and get data into a topic. We used the data in that topic. We enriched it. We transformed it. We aggregated it. We used it to serve up 
user-facing applications with Telegram as our front end to do stateful lookups, to do event-driven notifications. We also took that same data and we pushed it down to an analytics platform, in this case, using Elasticsearch and Kibana. So some of the key things here that might be useful as like patterns or ideas to take away into the kind of things that you might encounter in things that you build in the future is this idea of event-driven alerts. It's saying as events happen, we can actually build predicates against them. You can either use the Kafka Consumer API directly, or you can use KSQL DB to manipulate the data or write a push query against it. It's kind of like similar ideas. I've been using the API directly, and I showed you using curl to pipe into Kafka Cat, which is a little bit funky, but it works surprisingly well. Much more likely is you'll have your data coming into a topic, perhaps from a producer API that someone else is pushing it into, or using Kafka Connect. Because with Kafka Connect, you can stream data in from any number of systems, from databases, from message queues, from REST endpoints, from flat files, from wherever you've got data and thus events, you can capture those events, like any update or delete or insert made in a database is an event, and you can capture that and stream it into Kafka. And from there, you can do event-driven alerts out to your users. Those alerts can be based on the particular events themselves. They can also be based on aggregates. Excuse me. So you could say, in a 15-minute window, how many orders have we processed? And if that falls below what we would expect, we could send a notification because that falling below is also an event, but you can build those stateful aggregations also within KSQL DB. We can do key value lookups using the materialized view idea that we have within KSQL DB. So instead of saying we have a stream of events coming in and more and more people nowadays are comfortable with this idea of a stream of events, they say, okay, we've got a stream of events, we need to go and put it into another data store so we can then query it from our application. And what I'm saying is, well, you can do that and that's fine and that's valid, but also bear in mind, you can take that stream of events and you can query the state within it directly. You don't necessarily need that separate data store, which can like, upset some people, but it's true. You can actually query that state directly. So we say we're going to build the materialized view. We're going to run some DDL, a SQL statement, which says create this table. And I'm talking KSQL DB and SQL. If you would like to use Kafka Streams, which is what KSQL DB is built on, if you'd like to use Kafka Streams, which is part of, uh, part of Apache Kafka and Java, which is why I've not shown you because I don't code Java, you can do that kind of thing within your own Java application and build that state store and use interactive query to access it. So however you do it, you can then say, well, my user would like to know something about the current state. That state is updated within that materialized view based on events as they arrive. And my application can query that state either using poll queries in KSQL DB or interactive query in Kafka Streams API. We get the result back to our application and we serve it back to the user. One of the really important things, whether you're building applications, whether you're building pipelines, is schemas. And it's not a particularly cool thing to be talking about. It's kind of boring. It's like, oh, eat your vegetables. Like, you know you need to, but it's not kind of, it doesn't get you excited. But it's the kind of thing which actually helps you lay the really solid foundations for a successful project. Because if you're working with data that looks like this, you kind of like starting off on the back foot. You're having to like figure out what are these different fields. You're having to say to the people who wrote that data, what are these different things? And like, what's the time zone? And is it kind of this, is it that? And like, I'm assuming that that's the number of empty spaces and you just don't know these things. And you actually start to couple your systems back together, which you probably don't want to do. Um, so it's a bad idea just to use this, this schemaless data but a lot of time we have schemaless data, whether it can like by design or not, it exists. What we can do is we can take that schemaless data, we can apply the schema to it once and write that back onto a Kafka topic. And now multiple people can take advantage of that data with the schema. So we can say, here's the schema, we're gonna apply that, and then we write it back onto a topic. The last thing that I showed you was this idea of integration and saying as data arrives in Kafka, yes, we build applications against it. Yes, we do cool things like that. Yes, we can also take that same data and push it down to another system to drive our analytics. The key thing that we're doing here is that we're keeping things nice and loosely coupled. If I want to change and like, turns out that code that I wrote in Go was pretty awful as I suspected. Someone else wants to replace that piece of the puzzle with something that works better, they can without impacting this piece at all. 
if someone says, well, Elasticsearch is great, but for whatever reasons we're going to use Snowflake or S3 or Oracle or whatever, you can without impacting the other piece. So you have the data in Kafka and multiple applications can use it. You can do integration using Kafka Connect to push it out to other systems. You can use Kafka Connect to in ingest data from systems upstream as well. Like I mentioned, databases and message queues and so on. So pushing it from Kafka down to other places, building these end-to-end -end integrations, it's a really useful thing that you can do using Kafka Connect, which is part of Apache Kafka. So as we saw, I built a nice little dashboard. So there are some key reasons why we've done it like this. Part of it is like it was kind of quite a fun project, right? poking around on the internet and there's like various different open data sources and there's one about car parks near to where I live and you can like just start thinking and tinkering around with it and I wonder what you can actually build with it and it makes quite a fun example to show. But the key reason for actually building it like this and why it's quite a good example of the kind of things that you can do is that we're working with events or rather streams of events and events model the world around us. A lot of the time we kind of like take events and just like roll them up into state that we then go and store into our databases and NoSQL stores. But that data usually started life as an event. So building systems on the basis of events, even if we want to roll it up into state like we did with that materialized view, we still have those events available to build more loosely coupled systems and to also drive those integrations. We want to be able to react to things as they happen. We want to build up that state from that stream of events. We also want to have that latest data available to us for our analytics. So a couple of links to share with you. Hopefully that's been interesting. I'll be hanging out on Slack uh, if you have any more questions after this. But go and try it out for yourself. Scan the code or go to the URL. It's just Docker Compose up. Like I said, the API is an open one. So you can actually try seeing about like next time you visit Bradford, where should you go and park? You can use Confluent Cloud. That's what I've built the demo on here. It's a managed Kafka and KSQL DB and Kafka Connect that's available. And to go and try out more Kafka tutorials and videos and so on, head to developer.confluent.io. Thank you very much for coming. Hope you've enjoyed Gotopia. I think it's been brilliant. Um, enjoy the uh, remaining sessions of the day. I'm at Armoff on Twitter. You can follow me there. Check out our YouTube channel uh, as well. And um, thank you very much.